Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. My name is Justin LaRosa, and I serve as the director of the Portico. I'm one of the ministers of High Park United Methodist Church and down here every Sunday night. And every Sunday night, we have music, awesome music. We have conversation and silence and a message. And we are grateful that you came here to celebrate the birth of Jesus in this community. Wherever you are in your spiritual life, whatever you believe or what you don't believe, whatever your involvement has been in church or whether you have not been in church, I want you to know you are welcome here. We accept you right where you are and invite you to come and participate in our mission, which is to make God's love real. I hope you'll come join us some Sunday night at 5.30 here or over at the Hyde Park campus at the many services we have over there. And sometime soon, come back. And uh, before we get started, I'd like us to just bow our heads for one more prayer. God of all, we give thanks for all who are here, near and far. We pray that we all experience joy, hope, peace, and love during this night and during the days to come. Help us to be present to one another and to the message you might have for us. Open our hearts and our minds. May the singing and scriptures and candles and message penetrate each of us deeply, right where we are. I pray that my words might not somehow get in the way. In Christ's name, amen. So, how many of you have been watching Christmas movies this season? Anybody? I can't help it, and it doesn't matter if I've seen them a thousand times. I can't turn the channel. There's something about re-watching Christmas movies for me that transports me back to those cold winters up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in my childhood. There's something nostalgic about it for me. So one of the things we do every Sunday night at uh, the Portico is we talk about a question. We discuss a question, and we're going to do that tonight. For the introverts here, just speak with those you came with. For anybody else, turn around, and here's the question that you're going to engage for three minutes. Who is your favorite Christmas movie character and why? Who is your favorite Christmas movie character and why? Turn around to one another. Talk three minutes. I'll convene you back. Go. Starting with Ida. Okay, so this was the question that I posed uh, to my men's group uh, a couple of weeks ago, some of whom are sitting in the room, and then I put it on social media. And they, we got lots of responses. We had lots of good discussions. So let's see if the people that named those named yours. First and foremost, Ralphie. You show Ralphie? There he is, right? A Christmas story. Somebody wrote why. They said they loved his tenacity and he rocked the bunny outfit. That was why, right? Second one, Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. Got Scrooge for us? Oh, wow. No, all right. Got Scrooge? No? Yeah? No, we don't. Okay, so the next one hopefully we'll have is... Who, who liked Buddy? Okay, we got Buddy the Elf. Then we have the next one that someone named was Clark Griswold. Everyone, Clark? We got Clark people in the house. Related, Cousin Eddie. Who had Cousin Eddie? All right. Now, the next few are my favorites, which is why I include them. The first is the Grinch. Anybody have the Grinch? All right. A few of us. Very few. And then uh, probably even more favorite is It's a Wonderful Life. George Bear, Yeah. Creepy, creepy spiders everywhere. George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life. And of course, my favorite of all time, John McClane from Die Hard. And if any of you would like to argue with me, whether that's a Christmas movie or not, I will see you in the portico afterwards. So here's the deal. Why do I bring that up? Why do, why do I invite you guys, y'all to wrestle with that? Because powerful stories reach deep within us and invite us to reflect on important questions of our lives. They can transform our beliefs 
and it can actually shape our actions and perspectives. See, the characters that you name there, or that we name there, with the exception of Cousin Eddie, have a common thread. What they previously understood about Christmas and the meaning of Christmas dies. And something new and beautiful is born. Think about George Bailey for a moment in The Grinch. George comes to realize that position and fame and wealth aren't what make an abundant life. He discovers that his impact on people in small, tangible ways is what's made him the richest man in town. And then there's the Grinch. He discovers that taking away presents doesn't stop Christmas because Christmas isn't about materialism. He discovers that his own brokenness and that his need for forgiveness and his need for love is found in a community of friends. And his heart grew three sizes as a result. You see, what these characters previously believed was transformed. And their lives were changed forever. And so we come to our story today, and most of you know it. You know the shepherd's story. You either learned it when you went to church as a young person, or if you didn't go to church, you watched Charlie Brown's Christmas special. And Linus said the same exact scripture. He read that about the shepherds. And some of you believe this story. And some of you don't. And some of you aren't sure. And some of you haven't even really thought about it in a while. And all that is okay. But I want to suggest to you that this powerful account invites us to let go some of our old ideas about Christmas so something new and majestic and transformative can grow in our lives and out in the community. And I believe some of us, like George and Grinch and the others, need our own Christmas story rewrite. And so that's what we're going to invite you to today. And we're going to start with the the characters who can revise it better than nobody else in lovely view of who shepherds are. But let me tell you, in the first century, no. They were despised. They were outcast. There wasn't the romantic picture of the shepherds in the fields with the flocks. They were despised, seen as thieves by the society because their animals grazed on others' land. And the religious people shunned them and didn't want anything to do with them. They were seen as ghastly sinners in the first century. And they certainly weren't part of any church temple. So you know how this, the story goes. Verse 8 goes, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. In other words, the shepherds were doing what they always had done, going about their lives without much thought. And then God met them right where they were. And what happened was an exposure of the previously held views and beliefs about the church and God and themselves were exploded. They died. The angel shows up, scares them to death, and proclaims, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all people. And the angel tells them that a child's going to be born where he is and that that child will be the savior of the world. Say that with me. For all people. That was the key. The announcement that Jesus was coming into the world for all people. Shepherds and kings, poor and rich, religious and non-religious, straight and gay, liberals and conservatives, morally pure and morally corrupt, people who love very well and people who don't love well at all. The successful and the unsuccessful. For all people. Those three words were the foundations of the shepherd story rewrite because it exploded, it it exposed three flaws that they had. The first flaw had to do what they believed about God. The thoughts and beliefs that they held about the creator of the world were flawed. The second flaw had to do with what they and who they are and the church and the last was a flaw that they had around their role in the redemption of the world 
on that night 2,000 years ago, the shepherds' view of God themselves, the church, and their role died. And something new took root. And on our own Christmas story rewrite, we must too die to old ideas that we have about God, that we have about ourselves, and some of us that we have about a church community and our, and our participation in the redemption of the world. I want to tell you a story about somebody I met a couple of few years ago who I might say could be classified as a modern day shepherd. And with her permission, I share this story. When I met her, she was trying to rebuild her life. She had been addicted to heroin. She was homeless and at times was living on the side of 275, not too, too far from here in a tent. When she got pregnant, she couldn't stop. And her daughter ended up being taken at the hospital. You see, the world and society looked at her and viewed her as an outcast, maybe not useful in the kingdom or society. But she hit bottom, and when she did, that's where God met her in the field, in her own field of brokenness and despair. It was a powerful moment. She entered and got clean. She entered a program and got clean, but she couldn't find a job carrying the stigma of a modern day shepherd. And that's when I met her for the first time. You see, Hyde Park United Methodist op operates the Portico Cafe right across the way. It's a cafe with a mission. It's a place where new ideas and lives take root, where God is at work, not only in the lives of the people who work there, that, but in the lives of the people who come here, our modern day shepherds. And the, ca and the cafe hires people transitioning out of homelessness, addiction, and incarceration and gives them a chance to rewrite their story. It's a beautiful thing. You see, it was coming out of that program and into the Portico Cafe and in the things that she was involved with that she discovered that God had accepted her even with her past. It was revealed that God not only loves and chooses her, but she has a role to play in the healing and the transformation of the world here and now. And when she started, she was a barista in 2017. And she continued to thrive in that role. And she moved up as an assistant manager. And now she's the general manager of the Portico Cafe. You see, Mindy discovered God had a plan for her. You know, that's not even the best part. It's not even the best part. She has ma maintained sobriety. She's been reunited with her daughter, and now she's helping others rewrite their stories. And she happens to be here tonight. She's an amazing woman, and I am so proud of the way that God has transformed her because that's what the Christmas story is all about. The Christmas story is allowing each of us, wherever we are in our fields, to rewrite our own story with this night. The angels and the shepherds invite you and me to our own Christmas story rewrite, letting go of old ideas so that something new can be born. And maybe the foundation of our own rewrite, maybe you can't identify with kind of the, the dramatics of that story, the rock bottom of that. But I want to tell you there, there are ideas that we hold that God can transform to. And the first might be this. God desires an intimate relationship with you, and it can be found in Christ Jesus. For all people means you too. No matter what you, what you have believed about God, whether you've seen God as angry or distant or non-existent or don't even believe in God, we believe that God is calling you right in the field that you're in right now. The second thing is God meets you right where you are but loves you too much to leave you there. Paula D'Arcy, one of my favorite writers, says, God comes to you disguised in the shape of your life. God met the shepherds right where they were, but didn't wait for them to clean up and go into town. God didn't wait for them to come to the temple, get all perfect and clean. God sent them right then and there to on their mission to find 
Christ in the world. And that may be the case for you. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all the rituals. You don't have to know what each candle stands for. You don't have to uh, know all the up downs or what it means to be a part of a church community. What you need to know is that God loves you more than you'll ever know and is calling you into a relationship will that not only change your life right here and now, but will change it later in the community and for the community. You're accepted and chosen. And last but not least, you have a role to play in the redemption in the world. The greatest gift that the angels gave the shepherds was an offer of a renewed purpose to go and discover Jesus for themselves and to share that news with others. Each one of us, no, what, no matter what our stage in life or status is, is invited into God's kingdom. That's a churchy world to a new purpose of loving God and loving neighbor, which will bring some kind of love into an area of the world that needs it. God wants a relationship with you. God meets you where you are, but loves you too much to leave you there. And you have a role to play in this life here and now. You know, it isn't clear if the shepherds believed it right then and there with the angel. But it does say this. They went with haste to Bethlehem to see if it is true. And they discovered a baby lying in the manger. And their story revision was complete. The experience of a Christmas story rewrite can happen anywhere. For some of you, things are going great in your life. And it can be on the mountaintop of life when things are going well. And some of you can be in the nadir of despair that Amy described earlier with broken relationships or stuck in hurt ha habits or hang-ups. And you're feeling lost. The Christmas rewrite can happen there. Or it can happen just like it did for the shepherds out in their field going to Christmas Eve service like they do every year. But it will always mean three things. Your view of God will be changed. Your view of yourself will be changed too. And you will participate in God's transformation of the world. So my question for you on this Christmas Eve, when you leave here, will you go with haste. Your story revision awaits. Let's pray together. God of light and of love, we give thanks for this community, this community of faith, the people who came from near and far, people who came willingly and unwillingly, people who are happy and people who are sad. You tell us you meet us right where we are. We pray that if it be your will, you would reveal yourself to each one. Show us what to do and what not to do. And if any don't have a faith community or want to make God's love real, let them come and see. We ask all these things in the power of the little helpless baby. Amen.